I dreamed that I was walking along the sands of time. It seemed I saw my whole life flash before my eyes. The one who walked beside me gently led me by the hand. Together we walked onwards, left our footprints in the sand. And looking back, it seemed in times of heartbreak and despair. I only saw a single set of footprints walking there. When I questioned him beside me, were you really always near? The answer that he gave me still echoes in my ear. Footprints in the sand, walking side by side. Walking on forever with Jesus as my guide. All the time I thought I walked alone, but His voice, so kind and true, said that single line of footprints was when I carried you. La da 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 da. Through every time of disappointment, every time of lonely tears, there's one thing ever constant, never changing through the years. There's a love that's so much stronger than our weary mortal frames. There's a love that sees our weakness and loves us still the same. And even though the storms may blow across that windswept sand, and even when our trials may seem so hard to understand, there's a voice that whispers softly with a promise so sublime. With you always until the end of time. Footprints in the sand, walking side by side, walking on forever with Jesus as my guide. So many times I thought I walked alone, but His voice, so kind and true, said that single line of footprints. Carried you. Footprints in the sand, walking side by side, walking on forever with Jesus as my guide. So many times I thought I walked alone, but His voice so kind and true said that single line. When I carried you When I carried you God bless you, and thank you for being here to share with us again today. As you could see from the thumbnail, um, we were taking a week's break from our Can You Hear Me series. Yesterday, I had a very difficult day. I'm still having one. But my daughter passed on and went to be with the Lord. Uh, she'd been fighting a very aggressive brain tumor for about a year and a half. She was first diagnosed in, in June, a year and a half ago. 
And she went through two surgeries, a lot of chemotherapy, and it not been an easy time. And last night, I was laying on my bed. I couldn't sleep, and I was laying there thinking. And it was, it was so hard even to grasp, you know, that I will never have another conversation with her. I used to joke, because we used to always call her Chatty Charity. She would come in and just want to start chatting and chatting and chatting. And uh, that's not me. But anyway, she would come in and start chatting away. And then when she was in the hospital, she would phone several times during the night, all night long. Or she would be sending a text. My phone would be ringing or it would be beeping. Because she was afraid. And she was lonely in there in the hospital. And so it would be ringing and beeping and... You know, sometimes I was like, oh, come on, Charity, let me sleep, you know. But last night I was laying there thinking, you know, I'm not ever going to have another conversation with her this side of heaven. And I'm not ever going to have any of those phone calls ringing at night or the beeping texts coming in because last night I was waiting for them. But I already miss her so much. So I know several of you have been praying for her over this time. I want to thank you for that. And a, a dear friend of mine who has been praying as well in this time is somebody, some of you know, Cindy Jacobs. And she sent me, I sent her pretty much what I was just telling you. And um, so she sent a message. She said, that's very hard. She is your baby. But no doubt she is dancing all over the place and wants to see everything. That was always charity. You know, she doesn't want to miss anything going on. She wants to be a part of everything. And so I said, I said that to Cindy and Cindy says, I see that she wanted to go and dance and worship in the throne room, first of all. And I said, she's probably still dancing there. And Cindy said, of course, she hasn't been able to enjoy being free like that for a while. And it's true because she's been struggling and trying to battle. She was really trying to hold on because her 17-year-old son, it's all she's she's all she's all he's ever known. He never knew his dad because of the things going on, and she she never met he never met him, and so he's here living with us right now, and having a very hard time because he lost his mom yesterday. There's a picture I want to show you way back when Charity was first born. There she is. She's only a few weeks old here, and this reminds me so much of a story I'm going to tell you in a little bit, but she was born. We, my husband and I, we'd come back from Africa where I'd been on the mission field because my grandmother was dying of leukemia and she wanted to meet my husband and she knew that I was pregnant. And this was right before Christmas. And because I had been overseas for so many years, this was going to be the first time that her whole family was going to be together for Christmas. So she forced herself to carry on, to stay on, so we could be together for that Christmas. And then it was only going to be a few weeks until Charity was born. Her birthday was February 7th, 1978. And Grandma held on long enough to see her first great-grandchild. But shortly after Charity was born, she went on to be with Jesus. She went on to heaven. But she waited till the very end until she met her great-grandchild. And then there's a picture just of Charity when she was a baby that I just loved. She was such a cute little girl. She came out when she was born. She was a very hard delivery. I had 37 hours of hard labor with her due to some complications from some surgery I'd had years earlier. But she was born with this great big head of afro of curly hair. And she always had it. It was so cute, so sweet. But then... After she was born, when she was five months old, we headed back to Africa. And there's a picture here of her out in the garden in Africa in her walker. She loved it. She loved playing in the dirt. She loved everything about it. And you could see the great big smile on her face. But then I ended up getting quite sick, and we had to come back to Canada when she was not quite two years old. Or maybe she was just two years old. Somewhere right in there, we came back to Canada. And... Charity was someone, to this day, anybody that knows Charity knows she loves purses. And here's a picture of when her addiction for purses started. She was just tiny, just a toddler. And she'd find a purse and she'd put it on and start packing it. Everywhere she went, she would pack that purse around. And if somebody came to visit, if they were missing their purse, we knew where to find it. If I was looking for something from my purse, I knew exactly where to find it if I couldn't find it. Because there she was.
But then Charity grew up and and um, she helped a lot. She had such a heart and love for those in need. I always thought she should go into working with the elderly. Instead, she studied law. But I thought she should go into working with the elderly because she was so good with them. And um, then she had a passion. At the church that I pastored, we had an outreach to the homeless. And she absolutely loved it. To the point that there's this one homeless man. She always served him his dinner and he always loved to chat with her. And um, she was constantly there chatting for him. And she, one night he came in and she was talking with him and he was digging around in his bag. He said, I have something for you. I found this and I wanted to give it to you because it's so beautiful. It reminds me of you. And he had this crystal platter. And it was, it was real crystal and it was gorgeous. He found it in a dumpster and he, he could have sold it for, at the pawn shop and got you know, a good amount of money for, for him. Instead, he gave it to say thank you to charity because of her heart. But then as, as charity, she got older and she had ended up getting married with, which was, well, she got, was with this guy and um, the, she got pregnant. And then through, through some circumstances, I won't get into the details. He had to leave the country. and um, But she had this beautiful little baby boy that was born. There's a picture of Charity with Malachi. That's my grandson. He's 17 now. And he's here living with us right now. You'd be praying for him. It's not an easy time for that little one. But anyways, Charity was such a good mother. She dedicated so much to him. You know, sure, like everybody, she went through some times. But she was thoroughly in love with that little guy. And then as you know, she carried on, things were difficult, things were different. She was having a hard time. And a lot of times she would just sort of sit, put her feet up. There's a picture here. You can see she's got a smile on her face. This is sort of just before she was diagnosed. Uh, we knew it was coming. I knew something was coming. I didn't know what it was, but I knew something was wrong just from some things that she did or things that happened. I knew something was wrong. And then she ended up in the hospital with this brain tumor. And she was battling with it for a while. She had surgery June a year and a half ago. And then she was going through radiation. She went through a whole series of radiation. And then she was on chemo. I think, I think it was around 20 series of chemo that she went through. And then they found the chemo wasn't working anymore. And they had to try something different. And so... Um, they tried some other, they brainstormed the oncologist and the neurosurgeon. They were discussing some possibilities and the oncologist thought they really needed to try this other chemo, but it was IV chemo and she was going to have to go in to the cancer clinic to have this chemo every day. And, you know, she didn't have a vehicle, she didn't drive and it wasn't going to be easy for her to do it. But she was so determined she wanted to live she wanted to live because her son is going to graduate this spring. And she wanted to be there for that. We had his grad pictures taken. So in her hospital room, she had a picture of him in his grad picture. And she kept, and when she was still able to talk, she kept saying, I can hardly wait for his graduation. I want to be there for it. I so want to be there for his graduation. And um, it didn't happen right at that time. She didn't make it. But he knows that she loves him. And he knows that that was her desire. And she was trying so hard to hang on to be there. There's another picture I'm just going to ask Jerry to put up. It's a little bit older. It's one with Pastor Hector from Argentina when the kids were little. When the kids were little and uh, really little, and I was a single mother, um, Hector, it was decided that, or he had said he would be happy if something happened to me. Because I got very seriously sick. And so they decided if something happened to me, Hector was going to make sure he took care of the kids that they were taken care of. So there's Hector with Charity right beside him. And then Michelle with her back to you and Carl, my son. Even at that young age, Carl was towering over everybody. He's six foot five. But anyhow, when she ended up in the hospital the second time, they did her second surgery. And they were hoping that that would bring down the size of the tumor enough to give the chemo a better chance to work. But she was already very weak when she had that surgery. She was so, so weak. 
and her whole left side was not functioning properly. She was falling. She actually started having had a seizure. And she would go to stand up and she would fall. She'd try and hold something with her left hand and she would drop it. But she was trying so hard to do whatever she could. You know, because she knew, like, my husband is also going through, um, he's also going through radiation treatment right now for cat mother cancer that he's dealing with. And since my surgery, I'm not really able to do a whole lot since, since my accident. But... Um, she ended up back in for the other surgery. And when she came out of that surgery, she was so weak. They decided that she wasn't strong enough to go through with this other chemo treatment. And they decided there was nothing more that they could do. Her brother works in research in this type of tumors down in the States. And he was looking into everything he could find. Um, our family, we were looking at everything we could find. Her dad was, everybody was trying so hard to see something that could help. But finally, on Monday, they moved her into hospice. And the hospice room was really nice, and the staff were so good to her, so sweet. Where she was in the hospital, she was in a four-bed ward. It was so noisy, and the, the staff were run off their feet. They were working so hard just to be able to do the bare necessities. But in the hospice, they did everything for her that they could. They worked with her. They made sure that they cleaned her and changed her and turned her around and all this stuff, but they've taken such good care of her. But that was on Monday. Um, yesterday morning, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call. Your daughter's breathing has changed. She's having a very, very hard time breathing. You need to get in right away. Otherwise, you might not make it. So we headed in. And I want to show you a picture. Another one, it's her sister and her sister's kids, and my husband, her dad, her stepfather, they're in the picture with her in the hospital just before just before she got transferred over to the hospice. The kids, they really wanted to see their auntie, and they'd come up from the States. They hadn't been able to see any of us in two years because of the border closers. But here they got to see her and pray for her and talk with her, even though she wasn't really responding. They got to talk with her. and there was, you know, They were so happy to be able to get in. And Charity loved having people there. A lot of times, if her son was there and she heard his voice, she would reach up the arm that she could move. And she would reach it up for Malachi to take hold of. But once she got, we got into the hospital, I knew yesterday that her breathing was so bad. And um, you could, all you could hear is <gasps> gasping and gurgling in her throat and everything else. But I told her that her sister, Michelle, was on her way up from the States to, to try and get up here to be to see her and be with her. And so I would sort of report along the way. Oh, she's on the way. She's almost at the border. Oh, she's gone in to have her COVID rapid test, molecular test, so she could get in to Canada. Oh, she just crossed the border. And I kept telling Charity all these reports. She wasn't answering. Her eyes were closed. She wasn't responding. But I knew that she knew what I was saying. And then her dad, her natural father, that lives on the island, he was coming over. And as soon as he got on the ferry, he let me know. And I said, Charity, Richard, your dad's on the ferry. He's on the ferry. He's on his way over to see you. And, you know, I kept giving her reports. So the ferry's landed. They're coming here now. Oh, Charity's on her the last, Michi's on the last stretch of her, of, her, of her drive. She'll be here shortly. And, you know, Charity hung on until everybody was there. She hung on. She also had a, a little girl that had been even into an open adoption when Charity was quite young. And um, that daughter also made it in to say goodbye to her mom. And so they were all there, everybody. And it was just so beautiful watching her fight. And you could see at the end there, when Michi got there, her breathing was so, started to get so bad again and very weak and very shallow. And you could see she was, at one point I thought she had something stuck in her mouth. And I said, Mish, can you check and see if there's anything stuck in her mouth? And Mish, she checked, no, she got a little bit of stuff, but nothing major. And the next thing you know, Charity took her last breath. But you know, she looked so peaceful. We called down because they had some really strict rules as to how many people could be in the room. And they were bending over backwards to accompany, accompany us. I'm not, I'm not complaining about their, their treatment. And um, so I sat down and I said, please have Malachi 
and her dad was out of the room at that time and her brother. I said, please have them come up right away, right away. There was other people that were waiting. So they all came up and Malachi looks. He looked at his mom and she looked like she was just sleeping. She was so peaceful. And so um, he looks, he says, what's the matter, grandma? And I said, Malachi, your mom's gone to be with Jesus. She took her last breath. So you need to just be praying. And no, take her hand and tell her you love her, whatever. Bend over, give her a kiss if you want. And so then there's a picture I want Jerry to put up of the whole, our whole family, a more recent one. I gave you the beginning of her story with her and her father and me. And this is a picture that was taken just a few years ago. But you know, this was taken down in the States. And at that time, Charity's passport wasn't valid. And she didn't get a passport in time, so she couldn't come with us. And I really felt strongly I had to get her into this picture. So a friend of mine that does all graphic stuff, he photoshopped her in. So there she is right beside her son and her nephew standing in the picture. She got photoshopped in. And a lot of people didn't realize that she was just photoshopped in. But there she is with all of us. And now she's resting in the arms of Jesus. And there's a song that Jerry did that I wrote, and I've asked him if he would sing it here to close, but I'm going to say goodbye because I know after this song, I won't make it back in. So here's a song, Sleep Now, My Little One. Please listen to the words carefully as Jerry sings this for you. Now, my little one, and wake up in the arms of him who loves you truly, who loved you wholly, who gave himself for you and knows just what you're going through, and lives so you can live and love forever too. Sleep now, my hurting one. The night is fast approaching But remember Though you may tremble The arms that carried you till now Will soon be seen by you And you'll be happier than you have ever been So fly into the day Go do your mission We'll ache without you But we'll join you on that joyous day When pain and death have been forever put away So sleep my little one And wake up in the land we hear can only dream of place for us, for we will join you in good time, and be together with you, soul, body, and Together with
Stop.